Good morning, church. It is a joy and a privilege and an honor to be here and to share with you this morning a word from God. When our son, Kyle, was about 13 or 14, following a worship service one Sunday morning, we were having lunch and he said, Dad, I have noticed that when you were out of town during the week at meetings or other events, or you didn't seem to have a whole lot of time to prepare the sermon, that it seemed to get longer. <laughs> but I want you not to fear, because when I arrived this morning and entered into the family room where the deacons and the elders gather, there sat Dick Anderson and Gene Coors both with the litany, short, short, short. <laughs> I see. That short phrase on the lips of my mother immediately indicated to me that this 
beautifully concocted story that my friends and I had developed was not playing well. And I came to find out that it didn't play well in the kitchens of the other homes in our neighborhood either. For you see, we had come in with scrapes on our elbows and our knees and jeans and tennis shoes were torn. And we had tried to figure out a way to make it sound good. Didn't happen. I grew up in North La Junta, not far from here, an area of truck gardens and a couple of dairy farms, a couple of stores, a gas station, and lots of room for young people to roam. Fields and county roads and just places for us to go and explore the world. There were a couple of places that were verboten. One was the canal, the irrigation canal. Sandy banks, fast flowing water, and the gates that allowed water into the fields were places where the, the current would suck even the strongest swimmer under. The Arkansas River, great bottomland, great place to explore but we were not to be there either. And the third place was the dairy. We were not allowed in the cow pens or particularly in the pen of Prince the Bull. On this particular warm summer Sunday afternoon, a fourth place was added to the list. For you see, we had discovered that grain shovels on the steep shale slopes was great riding fun. Now we had been there in the winter time with snow and it was just delightful and so we figured out it would be just nice to do that in the summer. And it was. Somehow our parents didn't quite agree that that was the fun place for us to be. Later in life, when we had our own children, I began to realize that the anxiety and the fear and the concern that mom expressed that day was not entirely just for that moment. But she had seen the risk of my future, that in that event, had put at risk all of the hopes and the possibilities and the dreams of my future. I suspect that we use that term ourselves, I see. And we use it in a variety of different ways. Sometimes it is just to see our physical world, to see the beauty of the aspen trees as they turn in the fall, to see the sadness of a landfill or the scarring on a mountain. Other times we see deeply into a person and we see the essence of who they are as person and as individual. These two dimensions became very clear for me. The first pastorate that I served out at Burlington, Colorado. When the congregation called me, there were many in that community wondered about the sanity of a congregation that called a young bearded pastor from Southern California who drove a Volkswagen bus. Somehow that didn't fit in this rural community. After I'd been there about two years, I shaved part of my beard maintained the sideburns and the mustache. And I had gone downtown to visit with the owner of one of the businesses who was from the Methodist Church. Our two congregations were working together on the migrant school. And so I needed to visit with him about that project 
and I went in and I was standing there and we were visiting. I had been in his business before. We had played golf together. We had had meals together. And finally he said to me, I should know who you are, but who are you? <laughs> Later, in about September of that same year, a member of the congregation who followed the wheat harvest with trucks and combines and who had left before I shaved, he and I were having lunch together at the wagon wheel, and after about 15 minutes, he finally said, Sartan, okay, what is it? There's something different about you. And I began to realize that the first person had seen the physical. The second had seen the internal. It seems to me like that that is part of what our scripture today is all about. Seeing who we are as a person, not as a definition, but as a person. I'm often a bit disturbed by Bible studies that begin with people seated in a circle and saying, now what does the text mean for you? It seems to me like that the first question that we always need to ask is, what does the text say? And so let's examine what the text says this morning. It's very simple, very short, and very sweet. Jesus is on his way. He sees a man named Matthew seated at the tax table and says, follow me. Isn't it fascinating of what's not said? It doesn't begin with Jesus sees a tax collector. He does not put a definition around him. He does not put expectations within him. He sees a, a human being. He sees a person named Matthew. I think that's what God sees in us. One of the things that's interesting to me is that when I was at Boys Town, one of the things that would occur when we were getting together with uh, chaplains and therapists and family teachers staffing a young person, invariably someone would say, if we could only help Jeff or Linda or Sarah or Jackson or Washington see the beauty within them, if we could only enable them to catch hold of that wonderful person that they are down deep inside, that person that had been covered up with all of the abuse and all of the words saying they were no good and had no value, if we could only help them Embrace that and allow that flowering person to grow. You know, teachers and coaches get it right. How often have we heard a teacher say, my task is to help my students grow and to find those strengths and gifts within them and to express them. It seems to me like as the church, we need to learn from the model of Jesus and see one another as person without all the definitions of being a homeless person, of being a wealthy person, of being a poor person, of being straight or gay or of a variety of ethnic options. To see each person as a person. Again, the refrain what does God see when God sees us? If we listen carefully to the scripture that was read this morning, 
It says that God created humankind in God's image and proclaimed creation good. And in the New Testament, we hear that God is love. If we put these together in our thinking, then when God created us in God's image, at the very core and the essence of who we are is love. We are love. What does God see when God sees us? I suspect that our anxiety and our fear and our concern is our memories of those things that we have done that are not so good. We're concerned that God sees our human foibles and our limitations and the mistakes and all of that human stuff that we're a part of. But the passage indicates differently. God doesn't put a definition around us and doesn't put expectations around us. God, I think, sees God's image. When God looks into our heart and looks into our mind and looks into the depth of our very being, God sees there God's image. And God's nurturing love is to nurture that image to grow and to develop and to expand and to become more and more our potential. Mom's concern was my future. God's concern is our future. Who we can become. And as the church, it seems to me that our mission and ministry is the same. That when we encounter one another along the pathway of life, regardless of the table that we are seated at, we are to see one another as a person with a name and then follow. Follow the one who envisions life in ways that we can never imagine. That imagines relationships and healing and beautiful ways that we can never imagine on our own. Follow the one who calls us not only out of our own love, but causes, calls us to love one another. even those we do not understand, even those that we have a difficult time with in our journey. This struggle with putting definitions around people when we first see them, well, I'm there. I've done that. I do that. Probably one of the biggest judgments that came down on I mean, it was several years ago, Bev and I were in New York City, and we were learning the subway system of which we came to actually enjoy traveling and moving about on the subway. And one of the things that occurred, you know, I had gone with this definition of New Yorkers, <laughs> wrong. We found New Yorkers to be exceedingly friendly, exceedingly helpful, Wonderful people. One afternoon we were on the subway. We had gotten onto the subway and it was very crowded. There was only room for us to stand. And as we were preparing to secure ourselves, two young men seated right here got up and gave us their seats. I couldn't help but notice them when we got on because they had hair spiked in every different direction and every spike was a different color, and they had more metal hanging from piercings than there was hanging in Grand Central Station. 
my definition was shattered because these were the two people who got up and gave us their seat. Peering within and seeing the person that God sees and accepting the fact that God sees us differently than what we anticipate. How many times have you heard someone say, I don't think I can go to church because I'm unworthy? Or maybe I can't come to the communion table because I'm not worthy. Operating out of a concern of how God may see them. And yet I believe that God sees them in, with God's image. A person like you and I. Struggling with life. But God sees their love. And sees who they are in the very core of who they are as persons. I want to conclude this morning with a story, a true story. Fred Craddock tells this story. It occurred in the 30s in a rural community in the hollers of Tennessee. There was a young mother there who had a son. The father and the mother were not married and the father had disappeared and so in that era and that time, the boy was considered to be illegitimate and treated that way. And on Sunday mornings, when his mother slept in from having worked late the night before in a restaurant, he would run, um, was about the town. For some reason, he was attracted to the Christian church and he would stop outside the window and listen. He would listen to the sermon, he would listen to the music, and then he began to move inside the church and he would sit on the floor behind the back pew, always ready and attentive when the service was coming to an end to split because he didn't want to be seen or recognized. One particular moment and one particular Sunday he was caught up in the worship. He was caught up in the sermon. He was caught up in the prayers. He was caught up in the music. And he found himself about a third of the way down the aisle as he had crawled an inch forward to hear and experience more of what was going on. The service came to an end and all of a sudden he realized where he was and he got up and stood up to, to leave and he heard the booming voice of the minister Young man, I know who you are. I can see the resemblance. Can't you? You are God's son. The young man went on to become the governor of Tennessee. The mission and the ministry of the church is to affirm what God sees within us as God's image and for us to see in the lives of each person we meet God's image. And we are to say to one another in a response of health and healing and life, I know you. I know who you are, young woman. I know who you are, elderly man. You are God's child.